My guest on this episode is Mike Bianchi, sports columnist for the Orlando Sentinel and a sports radio talk show host in Orlando. I've known Mike for a lot of years going back to our time at the Fox Regionals in Florida. In this episode, we hit on just about every aspect of sports in our home state from college to pro. And I got his take on the current state of the newspaper industry and where sports journalism is headed. Plus, you'll hear fun stories about big personalities he's covered, guys like Tom Coughlin and Steve Spurrier. And don't miss the story of how and why we once shaved his head on live TV. I demand satisfaction. My name is Whit Watson, and this is Media Credentials. I'm a sports announcer who's worked a lot of places. This podcast will peel back the layers of sports media and show you how the sausage gets made. Through interviews with industry pros and my own experience, you'll understand why you're seeing what you're seeing and who's responsible for it. Your media credentials have been approved. Mike Bianchi is Orlando's sports media renaissance man. He's been writing columns for the Sentinel for over 20 years, doubling up for the last dozen years as the morning show host on Orlando's 96.9 The Game. He had a TV career, too. He was a panelist with me on a couple of sports talk shows back in the old Sun Sports days. Like me, Mike is a proud native Floridian. We talked about his studies at the University of Florida and his stops at newspapers in Gainesville, Cocoa Beach, and Jacksonville. Now, this episode is definitely Florida-centric, but consider, between the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, Major League Baseball, and Major League Soccer, we have 11 pro franchises in this state with a combined 12 championship trophies. We have 13 Division I universities, and the so-called Big Three of Florida, Florida State, and Miami have combined to win 82 national championships over the years across all sports. Florida is where it's at. And Mike is on top of it. Mike Bianchi, radio guy, newspaper guy, former television guy. We'll get to that in a second. (laughs) Thanks for coming on. Uh, From your home office, I understand that this daily radio show has been broadcast from home ever since COVID. How does that work? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When COVID started, obviously, we couldn't go into the studio. You know, everybody was paranoid about COVID back then. I wish we'd known then what we know now about COVID. But anyway, no, nobody, nobody went into the studio. So they set me up with some fancy schmancy piece of equipment uh, that hooks up through my laptop. And it sounds like I'm in studio. And once the COVID scare was over, uh, everybody else went back into the studio and I'm like, hey, this is really convenient for me to just, you know, (laughs) stay here and do my radio show. Then I can just start my newspaper work right after doing radio. So I never actually I never come came back to the studio, much to the chagrin of some uh, at the radio station. Speaking of the newspaper work, this time of year, it's June as we record this. The NBA is done. Uh, The NHL is done. We're still a couple of months away from football. Uh, Orlando does not have a baseball team yet. We'll get mm -hmm. to that as well. So what do you focus on this time of year? Uh, This is the time of year where you, first of all, Whit, you know, it's the summertime. You work in media. This is the time of year you take vacations and you contrive you, you, you concentrate on topical issues like, you know, like, for instance, the merger between the PGA Tour and, and the, the Saudi Public Investment Fund. That's been a hot topic of late and will continue to be a hot topic, you know, through the U.S. Open and, and things like that. So there's always something to write about human interest. Uh, UCF just hired a new baseball coach. You're always talking college football or, or writing about college football, even if it even if it's two months away. So there's always something to write about in sports. And in fact, I like this time of year because it forces me to get out of my comfort zone and go find columns instead of waiting for them to fall into your lap. Now, I thought I was a Florida man, but you are as Florida as Florida can get. You were born in Florida grew up here. And to my knowledge, you've never worked anywhere else. Is that right? No, I've had chances to, to work in a myriad of places. I've had chances to go out West and work, you know, at the San Diego union in new Orleans and 
I had a chance to go to the New York Daily News one time. So I, I've had chances, but hey, I grew up in Florida. I love it here. My my family and friends are here. Um, people retire to come here, so why leave? So and I, I love it here. It's it's my home. It's always been my home. I was born in Alachua General Hospital up in Gainesville, and I've been around the state of Florida at the at the Florida Times Union in Jacksonville, Florida Today down in Cocoa Beach, Melbourne. Um, obviously, the Gainesville Sun. And now I've been at the Sentinel. This is this will be my last stop, though, at the Orlando Sentinel. Who or what inspired you to get into sports journalism? Uh, because, wit, like all of us, we get into sports journalism because we weren't good enough to actually play the sport itself. I was a really good high school baseball player. Thought I was going to be a major league baseball player, uh, and th- and then I, uh, you know, graduated high school go to junior college and got cut from my junior college baseball team. So that's when I knew I wasn't good enough to be a major league baseball player. So I became the sports editor of the, of the Viking horn, the St. John's river community college newspaper, the Vikings in Palatka, Florida. I became the sports editor and then the editor. And I really liked covering sports and writing about sports. So I said, Hey, this is, this is fun. I get to at least watch sports for a living and write about them and give my opinion. So, you know, it's not as fun as playing sports, but it's pretty fun. Who did you read in terms of sports columnists, sports writers growing up? Who were your favorites? I, I read all the state columnists, you know, Larry Guest, the old columnist, the Orlando Sentinel. I grew up reading him. My hometown paper was the Gainesville Sun, and they used to have a columnist named Jack Harston, Bill McGrotha at the Tallahassee Democrat, Hubert Mizell over at the St. Petersburg Times, Tom McEwen, of course, mm-hmm. at the Tampa. I, 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 when I was in high school, in, co- in college especially, I would go to the library and, and get all the state papers and, and the sports sections, and I would read all the state columnists. Um, Edwin Pope down in Miami is another one. So I grew up all, reading all the state columnists, and I would actually check out books at the library, uh, like, like you know, the uh, Red Smith, the great New York Times columnist back in the old days, and Grantland Rice, I would, I would read some of their biographies, biographies and books. So, yeah, I, I used Jim Murray, L.A. Times, legendary columnist. Uh, I, I read some of his collection of columns as well, but mainly the state columnists in Florida. And you stayed home to go to school, University of Florida College of Journalism. You're in the Hall of Fame there. What were the most important lessons you learned either in the classroom or outside of the classroom while you were in journalism school? Wow. Whoa, that's a long time ago. I'm going deep on you now. The most important lessons I learned at the University of Florida Journalism School. um, Well, there was a professor named Jean Chance, and she did a a fact-finding class. And that was the name of the class, Fact Finding. And she was a stickler on making sure you were right on everything. Get your facts right. Get everything right. And there was another um, professor there. Uh, what was his name? Buddy Buddy Davis. Buddy Davis. And Buddy Davis was actually a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial writer. At one time, he was an editorial writer of the Gainesville Sun, and he won a Pulitzer Prize one time. And he was a very opinionated guy, but he also was big. He goes, you can have an opinion and you can if you're a columnist or in a, you know, an editorialist, you can have your opinion. But just make sure you got your facts right. So he and Gene Chance sort of drilled that into me that, you know, cr- your credibility is important. I mean, there are so many. So many writers today who just shoot from the hip and don't check their facts and don't do any reporting. They're just they're just spouting opinions. I still think what I'm still a little old school. I think you need to do some reporting, even if you're a columnist and giving your opinion and making sure that you get your facts right. So Gainesville Sun and then on to Florida Today, which you mentioned covered the Space Coast, Cocoa Beach, Melbourne area. When you were there. What was the dominant topic? What was your most common subject matter? Well, that was that was at a time Florida Today was they were it used to be um, Coco Today and they switched over to the Florida Today format and they wanted to be USA Today. 
right. for the state of Florida. They even look like USA Today with all the colorful graphics and the short stories. And the reason I went to work down at Florida Today, I actually left the Gainesville Sun because they were going to be a quote, state of Florida newspaper and cover the state of Florida like USA Today covers the United States of America. And, you know, they made me the beat writer of the University of Florida. And I got to obviously become a a major college beat writer. I got to write columns. They let all of their writers write like, you know, we all wrote like a column or two a week. So it was a great training ground because I got to, you know, learn how to report and be a beat writer at a major college. And I got to uh, cut my teeth on writing columns as well. So it was a great opportunity. Had a great boss down there, Tom Squires. May he rest in peace. He's passed away. But yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Um, Learned a lot at Florida today. When you were in Jacksonville working for the Florida times union, the Jaguars were an expansion team in 1993. I have lived through the excitement of living in a city that lands an expansion franchise. When the Magic got here in 1989, Mm -hmm. that whole process, I was in high school and we lived through every minute of Pat Williams coming to town, the Pied Piper promising us an NBA franchise, and he delivered it. Was Jacksonville buzzing during those expansion days with the Jags? Oh, no question. I wasn't actually working in Jacksonville when they were going through the process of getting the Jaguars, but I was there the of the Jaguar the first year of the Jaguars' existence when they actually started playing. And yeah, I mean, you know, Jacksonville, it's always been a college football town. Gators, yep. um, Seminoles, the Florida Georgia game is in Jacksonville. It's a huge college town, and Jacksonville and the Jaguars. It was like a college atmosphere at an NFL game because all of those fans grew up as college football fans, and that's the sort of exuberance and enthusiasm they brought the Jaguars games. Now, like the Magic, the Jaguars got really good early in their existence. and The the Magic got Shaq and Penny three or four years in. Well, the Jaguars were in the AFC Championship game in their second season, and Tom Coughlin and Mark Brunel and Tony Baselli and that bunch, they were exciting. It was fun. Uh, I always said the uh, Jaguars fans and Magic fans, they never learned to suffer in those early years because they got good so fast. And then when the teams got bad, the fans didn't know how to react to the losing. So um, it was fun in those early years, uh, certainly. And uh, yeah, and but Coughlin, man, what a maniac he was. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what was he like to talk to? He was... Just as you would expect. I mean, he was close to the vest. He he wouldn't let his assistant coaches talk to the media. I remember one time, the offensive coordinator down there at the time was Kevin Gilbride, who Mm -hmm. people know Kevin Gilbride. And Kevin Gilbride was very media friendly, but Tom Coughlin wouldn't let him talk to the media. Well, you know, Gilbride, he still talked to us. He just didn't allow Coughlin to know. Well, one time... He had Pete Prisco, who was the the beat writer for the Times Union. He had Pete Prisco in his office and John Osher, who also worked at the Florida Times Union. Those were my two colleagues at the Times Union. They were in Gilbride's office talking to him. And Coughlin comes down the hall and you you could see Coughlin coming. And Prisco and Osher had to, to, to duck into a closet. To you know, to hide from Coughlin because they saw Coughlin coming because Coughlin wouldn't let Gilbride talk to the media. But that's the sort of guy Tom Coughlin was. But he was a hell of a he was a hell of a football coach, and he knew offense and he knew how to run an organization. Um, of course, <laughs> when he got back to the Jaguars as a the team president later, he was too much of a control freak in today's NFL, and that got him fired. From Jacksonville to Orlando, you got to Central Florida in 2000. You're from Florida, so it wasn't that much of a mystery. But what were your first impressions of Orlando? I actually went uh, from Florida today. I actually went back to Gainesville as a sports columnist to replace the guy. I grew up reading Jack Harrison, and that's when I got a chance to to cover Spurrier on a hometown basis, which was which was a great experience. When I worked at the Gainesville Sun. 
and Spurrier was the head coach in the in the early to mid nineteen nineties. That was the that was the most fun I had as a sports writer, I think, because Spurrier Spurrier's old school. He was, you know, and this was before the internet and, you know, the internet became big and everybody was, everybody was sort of catering to ESPN and ESPN.com. Spurrier grew up reading newspapers. And if it was in the hometown paper, he wanted to, if you wrote something he didn't like in the hometown paper. And I did on occasion, even though he was winning most of the time, I would write columns he didn't like. He would call me up at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, wake me up out of bed. Bianchi, Bianchi, that's the dumbest column I've ever read. Why, why, why did you write? And he would just give me all sorts of grief, and, and I would take it. And I knew that was just how he was. And we got along great. And uh, But that was the most fun I had, covering Spurrier as the hometown columnist for the Gainesville Sun. Yeah, I always got the impression, I remember those days now that you mention it, that he liked you. I mean, he and he gave people that he liked a hard time. That was kind of his way, right? Oh yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. He's the ultimate needler. He needles people all the time. His frenzy needles. Um, he yeah. That that's just the way that Spurrier is. He he likes to make you the butt of jokes. He just doesn't like to be the butt of jokes. Okay, so yeah, that that's the ego behind Steve Spurrier. And again, I, I most fun I've ever had was covering that guy. Uh, my claim to fame, in fact, Whit Watson, yes. is I coined two phrases that became you know uh, regulars of the Spurrier era. I'm the guy who came up with the fun and gun offense, the name fun and gun. I knew that. So I coined that. And also, uh, I, 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 I still do a weekly notes column, but in my weekly notes column in the Gainesville Sun way back then, it was after the Foot Locker incident at Florida State, and I wrote a little note in my column. You know, after the you know the Florida State players got nabbed for taking free merchandise from Foot Locker, and I came up with Florida State fr- free shoes, you. Yes. <laughs> and I put that in my notes column, and Spurrier stole it and took it on the Gator Booster Club speaking circuit, and he got all the credit for it. So. That was one of his all timers, and he also used to say, "You can't spell citrus without UT." Oh yeah, a reference to Tennessee Absolutely. playing in the Citrus Bowl. Uh, yeah. Okay, now speaking of Orlando, when you did get here uh, twenty three years ago, again I, I said you you knew Orlando. I'm sure you'd been here before, but as a market, what was your impression? My impression of Orlando was unlike some of the other places I worked, Gainesville, where you had one team, the Gators, that every, everybody focused on. In Jacksonville, you had one team, the Jaguars, everybody focused on, and, and college football. In Orlando, it seemed to me much more, much more cosmopolitan, much more of a transient population. Um, yeah. A lot of Magic fans, but a lot of fans from New York, L.A. Um, obviously, Orlando is still a college football town, but to me, Orlando was more more than just a college football town. It was more of a cosmopolitan city than some of the other places I worked in Florida. I think there's more of a diverse interest of different sports and different teams in Orlando. You touched on it earlier. How do you generate ideas for columns, and what is the writing schedule like? Well, ideally, you generate columns. Uh, you know, like when I, you know I mentioned when you know, when I was in Gainesville, and the Gators were really good, and Spurrier was a personality and very candid, and he was always saying something or doing something that was worth writing about and the Gators were winning games and they were beating Georgia every year. And there was a lot of interest. So that's easy. And the jet, when I was in Jacksonville, same way, the Jaguars were really good, made it to two AFC championship games in their first four or five years of existence. So there was a lot of interest in the Jaguars. Well, when I got to Orlando and quite frankly, the, the, you know, the Dwight Howard years obviously were really good, but for the most part, most of the years I've been in Orlando, the Magic had not been very good. I mean, there was the 
you know, the Grant Hill, the six years of the Grant Hill contract, and he was always injured, and that sort of held the franchise back. Then they get Dwight Howard, and they're good for that four or five years with Stan Van Gundy as the coach. But over the last decade, the Magic have not been good. So it's been hard to, you know, and when the Magic aren't good, there's not much interest in the Magic. I hate to say it. So it, it, it's harder to generate columns if your teams aren't good. I mean, no, but people don't want to read every day about fire the coach or fire the GM or the owner needs to sell the team, all of that stuff. So it's harder to generate columns. But again, one of the things I love about Orlando is you don't have just one. Like, I don't know if I would like being in, for instance, being in New York or, or even Tampa, all right? where you have the Rays and you have the Lightning and you have the Bucks and a lot of your your writing is you go to games and write about the games. And I, and I like going to games, don't get me wrong. And, and, but I like writing about the aftermath of games and the build-up to games more than I actually write like writing about the games themselves, quite honestly. I like writing about issues, topics, um, hot button issues around the team, around the sport. Um, the games are great. Don't get me wrong, especially in football where the games mean so much, but a regular season magic game or a regular season baseball game that doesn't really fire me up. So again, I love Orlando because it gets you out of the comfort zone of just covering games. And that's your column college football you could fall out of bed and write a column about college football. You've got that much experience. Are there sports that are harder for you to write about simply because you don't have an equal amount of experience with them? Oh, absolutely. I don't, first of all, I don't write about hockey. I mean, when the lightning were in the playoffs and they're in the, in the Stanley cup finals, I might go over to Tampa and write a column if it's game seven or something like that. But I have no expertise at hockey. I'm not going to pretend to, you know, be an expert on writing about hockey. Same with baseball. We don't have a baseball team in Orlando. I've never been in a city that had a baseball team. I follow baseball. I watch baseball on TV, uh, not as much as I used to, but I try, I actually try to stay away from sports that I don't have any expertise in. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, even when I'm doing my radio show, for instance, like, I remember when I first got to Orlando, um, there were guys on the radio that all they would talk about was national sports topics. Like, you know, you know, there, you, I remember Dan Cilio was, was the morning radio host at the time. And he, he would talk about the Yankees and the, all of the, the Dodgers and the Lakers and these national sports topics. And when I started a radio show, I was like, ah, if people want to listen to national sports topics, you know, you can turn on ESPN radio, you can watch ESPN and those guys, those guys are experts at that. They get all the national guests. They, they know the national topics, but you cannot turn on ESPN or you're not going to go to ESPN.com and they're not going to be writing about UCF joining big 12 or, you know, what's going on with the Gators or what's going on with the magic. To me, I try to stay local as much as I can because of those are my topics of expertise. How did the radio show get started in the first place? Well, actually, Dan Cilio got fired. Well, for, you know, the, the, the one of many times Dan Cilio got fired <laughs> was, here, was here in Orlando, and the um, the big wig at, at iHeart Media, it was Clear Channel then, I think, but yep. iHeart, but she was looking for a morning radio host and I'd had some experience doing radio up in Jacksonville and she was actually from Jacksonville. So she'd heard me on the radio up in Jacksonville and she knew who I was. So she called me and asked me if I was interested in doing a morning radio show, hosting a morning radio show. And I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. You know, and I was a little worried about the newspaper industry and, you know, obviously being on the downswing and I got, and I was thinking, like, oh, I'll probably get fired from the newspaper eventually once they start laying off people. And problem was, I never got fired from the newspaper, and I've been doing two jobs now for a, a dozen years. How long? I was that was my next question. How long have you been on the radio, and while also writing for the Sentinel? Uh, about a dozen years now. Um, yeah, 
And it's uh, it's a I have to admit it's a grind with it's uh, you know, I get up at like three o'clock in the morning to prep for the radio show. So so I do my radio show. It goes from six to nine thirty. So I prep for that, do the radio show. And then if I have a column to write that day and I write three or four columns a week for the Sentinel, um, then I'll, you know, maybe take a hour nap and then start doing my column work. So it, it, it can be a grind. It can be like 16, 17 hour days. And we've not even gotten to your wildly successful television career yet. Oh, this is my I miss favorite that. part. Uh, for those who don't know, for a few years starting 2003, you were a regular panelist on a talk show called Sports Talk Live on the Fox Cable Channel Sun Sports, which is now Bally Sports Sun. And you've done enough of it to know how things work. How did TV with me uh, differ from print or from radio? Well, when we were on Sports Talk Live, which became Tailgate Overtime, I believe, right? I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. It became, ta- yeah. And it was, you know, we, we, it, at, at, when it became tailgate overtime, it was a college football show where we and we had a lot of notable college football personalities. You were the host. We had um, William Floyd, Florida State star. We had Chris Doring, Doring Gator star. We had um, who do we have from Miami? Steve. Uh, yes. And I'm blanking and I'm going to be so embarrassed. Steve Walsh. Steve, Steve Walsh. Walsh. Yes. Yeah, we had Steve Walsh on, and they and they were, you know, they they were big names, the big personalities. The big difference in TV was, you know, when you have a panel on TV, you have to make your point and make it quick. Yes, because these other guys are, you know, they're they're chomping at the bit to make their point, and they're the bigger names, and they're the ones that the fans are really turning on to see. So you have to. I had to make my point and I had to be strong with my point to, because those were some big names and big personalities I had to not overcome. It was great working with you guys, but they were, uh, it was, it was fun. And I learned a lot doing that. When I told my wife that I was going to bring you on the podcast, she reminded me of something that I had completely blanked on. Did we shave your head on live television? Absolutely. It's one we of did, yes. didn't we? Yeah, I think it was the most highly rated show in tailgate <laughs> overtime history. I, well, first of all, with the, the, there was an ulterior motive on my part. I was losing my hair, all right? right? I was going bald, and I was trying to do the comb over, and it was ridiculous. So I came up with this idea that I was going to make a bet on tailgate overtime, and if I lost the bet, I would shave my head right there on statewide TV. And I, and I bet, I bet that Florida state under quarterback, um, Chris Ricks yes. would be, would beat Miami one year. And of course, Florida, Chris Ricks blew the game somehow. And I ended up shaving my head on that. Yeah. And all you guys were standing around you. Had, you actually brought a barber on. We uh, did uh, see it, it all came back to me once she said that, but I had completely forgotten that. Yeah. I wish I had a copy of that show. That would be classic. We'll put that out there to the universe. <laughs> if anybody has a copy of it, please get in touch with me. I uh, claim to fame. Yeah. Um, I've been bald ever since. And you kept it right. That was, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But I wanted to do it anyway. That's the only reason I made the bet. Was I right about the big three in college football in Florida becoming the big five no you were close i was close you were close i mean it's certainly become the big four and i still think the big 12 should have taken usf as well even though usf's program has been downtrodden over the last few years but yeah you were when i think you said that on that very show yeah i said it on the show and i wrote a column for the old website the sun sports website saying that we were on the verge of the big three becoming the big five. And this was, I want to say, I know that Jim Levitt was at the University of South Florida. They got up to number two mm-hmm. in the old in the old yeah. BCS rankings one year. And that it lasted was, about a week. I lasted think, about a yeah. week. And yeah. then George O'Leary was at UCF and turned them around from a an 0-11 team to a bowl game the following season. And I just thought there's going to be two more serious contending programs in this state and i was almost right to your point big four. yeah and 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 you may end up being right because usf it was just announced this last few days they're building an on-campus football stadium they got the the funding approved for that 
I still think USF someday will be in a Power 5 league. That's a huge TV market over in Tampa. But, yeah, we are certainly right now the big four. UCF getting ready to move into the Big 12. We all know Florida, Florida State, and Miami, they've always been the big three in this state. But UCF, with the demographic of that school, the TV market, the recruiting base here in Orlando, and they're getting ready to start you know, cashing those big uh, media checks that Florida, Florida State have been cashing for years. With that influx of money, I think UCF has every chance to be competing for championships, just like the Gators, Knowles, and Canes do. Just about every sports market in the state of Florida has boomed while you've been writing about it. We've talked about the big three in college, but now two NHL teams, two NBA teams, two Major League Baseball teams, three NFL franchises. How do you keep track of it all, and how do you maintain the relationships that I know are necessary to do your job? Well, well I'm so old. I remember when, when I grew up, we had one in a – well – yeah, when I in my in, when I was a tyke way back in elementary school, the only team that we had in the state was the Dolphins. The only right. pro team we had was the Dolphins, and then the Bucks came around in 1976, I believe, and then it's just skyrocketed from there. I mean, good lord, every sport, and, and yeah, it's it's hard to keep track. Again, I try to stay local. Obviously I keep track of what's going on in Orlando with Orlando city, the Orlando magic UCF. I still keep track of the Gators FSU, not Miami so much because we have a sister paper down there. uh, The South Florida sun Sentinel that covers Miami. And that's how we get a lot of our Miami coverage in the Sentinel. The, the Tampa Bay Bucks, I try to stay on top of them a little bit, but I, I, I am mainly, I try to stay connected to the Orlando teams and Florida and Florida State. Those are the, those are the ones I focus on. What are the differences in terms of coverage for college sports versus professional sports from, from your perspective? From my perspective, the, I, I think the Sentinel has uh, in the past, and m- maybe it's because of me, because that's where my interest lies. I grew up as a college football fan because, as I mentioned, back in the day, that was our pro sports. I mean, we had the Dolphins, and then, but we, we looked at the Gators, the Knowles, and the Canes. Those were our pro teams back in the day. So that's where my interest is. But I've always thought the Sentinel um, has covered college football better than any media organization in the state simply because as i mentioned there's not there's not a whole lot of there's not a lot of other pro sports franchises in orlando now orlando city recently has come on the scene but essentially it's been the magic in college football if you're in tampa and you're a you're a columnist or a sports radio host over in tampa you're talking about all of Tampa's pro teams, mm-hmm. uh, which are all pretty damn good. In, in yeah. Miami, you're talking about all of Miami's pro teams. But in Orlando, college sports and the magic are, in my opinion, those are the big topics that I focus on. And those are the topics that I think most people are inter- interested in, as well as golf, obviously. I mean, we well, obviously we, t- we talk a lot about golf and write a lot about golf. But NASCAR, uh, when the Daytona races come around, I think college football, I've always said this. I, I think Orlando is an NBA city, but I still think at its core, it's a college football town. For those outside of Orlando, to stay local here for a second, the former general manager of the Orlando Magic, Pat Williams, the guy who essentially brought the NBA to Central Florida, is now leading a push to bring Major League Baseball to Central Florida. And he's looking for some public funding to attempt to build a stadium to get either an expansion team or to lure a team to move to Orlando. Mike, what do you think the chances are of that happening? I think it's a long shot, uh, first of all. But, you know, as Pat Williams likes to say, back when Orlando was trying to get the magic, that started out as a long shot as well. And Pat Williams and, you know, his sidekick, former Orlando businessman, Jimmy Hewitt, they got it done. So, but this is a this is a different time. First of all, there's no team available right now. Right. Um, the Tampa Bay Rays have not said that they're going to move out of Tampa. They're going to 
they're going to obviously have a final push to try to get a new stadium built over in Hillsborough County. So they're not available. The Major League Baseball has not announced that they are going to expand. They've they've said that they want to expand uh, in the near future, but there's been no expansion announcement. So there's no team right now to get, and Pat Williams and his group are trying to get tourist development tax money, almost a billion dollars of it, by the way, to build, to potentially build a stadium if they can land a team. I think that, I, I think more politicians in this city need to get behind this because there, there's no risk if you don't get the team, all right? There's no risk, you don't, you're not building a stadium if you don't get a team, but if you can get a team, I think we should at least investigate and do everything we can to build a baseball stadium and get Major League Baseball in Orlando. Where I don't, how old were you when the Magic were? Uh, when when Pat Williams was trying to bring the Magic to to Orlando, it was during my high school years. So like sophomore, junior, senior year was the build up, and then their first season was my freshman year of college. Okay, well you probably you probably remember back then the mayor of Orlando, a guy named Bill Fredericks, I think his name was. He was like helping lead the effort. He was like, yeah, yeah, we will get this arena expedited and we will get it built to land an NBA team. I'm not seeing that from the politicians in Orlando just yet. Maybe it's because there's no team available right now and they're just waiting to sort of jump on the bandwagon. But, you know, Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, he's he's been silent about this. Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer, who was instrumental in getting the new Amway Center built to sort of keep the magic in town. He's been sort of quiet about this. I wish some politicians would jump on board and say, yeah, we want to bring baseball to Orlando. But I haven't heard that. That's why I think it's a long shot. I thought it was interesting earlier when you said that part of the reason why you took on the radio responsibility was because you were concerned about the health of the newspaper industry. And that was 12 years ago. And I feel like, I feel like we tell that same story every single year. There's, Mm -hmm. there's been a lot of obituaries written about newspapers. And yet everywhere I go around the country, when I travel, you can still get a newspaper, Mike, they're still printing newspapers. What do you think is going to happen next? Yeah, they're they're still printing them, just not nearly as people, nearly as many people are getting them in their home. Now they're still consuming the information digitally via OrlandoSentinel.com, or you know, most a lot of people have digital. You know, most, every newspaper has a digital website where you can subscribe to that. Now the problem is the newspaper industry and a lot of industries haven't figured out how to really, really monetize the internet. And a lot of people want their information for free on the internet and still aren't willing to pay for it. So the, believe me, the, the newspaper industry financially is in dire straits right now, much more than it was 12 years ago. So uh, I, I think eventually you're not going to be able to get a newspaper. There are a lot of cities. I think the Florida Times Union up in Jacksonville, they don't print. Uh, on Saturdays, they only print three or four days a week. There are a lot of newspapers that do that. The Sentinel still prints seven days a week. So good for the Orlando Sentinel for that. I just don't know how much longer you'll have actual newspapers. We'll probably still call OrlandoSentinel.com the newspaper website, but I just don't know how much longer there'll be actually be a newspaper. I'm sure you get asked for advice all the time from aspiring sports journalists. What do you tell them? I tell them that there are many, many formats and forums now where they don't, you know, first of all, well, the first thing I tell them is to, if you want to be a sports writer, call up the sports editor of the Sentinel or email the Sentinel sports editor and say, hey, can I help you guys out on Friday night taking prep high school calls and get your foot in the door somehow, whether it be at a, you know, a a low paying job, part-time job, or even as an intern and try to get in the door that way. And the other thing I tell them, especially for sports writers, if you want to be a sports writer, there are so many platforms now that you can publish your own stuff, whether it be WordPress, um, all of these blogging platforms, Substack. I mean, you can, you can become, hell, look how Bill Simmons got started. Sure. 
he got started writing his own blog and now he's a, a, a mega millionaire podcaster, sports media figure. There are so many ways now to monetize yourself, whether it be online on, you know, uh, the writing, whatever. So there's no excuse for you not to be doing something to better yourself in writing. And even in, in, in you know, I, I do radio, but Wit, you do a podcast. It's not very expensive to start a podcast, is it? No, it is not. And yeah. it's not very complicated. Yeah. So, and that's what I tell them. There are so many formats out there. Go make yourself known because there are ways to do that now. One of my favorite things that you ever wrote or said was the job of the columnist. Mm -hmm. It's practically your credo. Tell me what that is. Uh, actually, it's not, I, I think I stole, I think Rick Riley actually came up with this, but I, I stole it from him. The job of a columnist is to watch the battle from a mountaintop and ride down and bayonet the wounded, I, I believe. Is that the quote you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. And yes, and that's, and let's face it, and not just commas. That's what that's what a lot in the media do. You watch the game, all right, and then you second guess the coach and why he should have did this or that was a terrible call and the coach should be fired for this. And um, it, it's sort of you know it's hyperbole to say that quote, but in a lot of ways, if you if you watch all the debate shows on ESPN and and FS1, that's what they do. They watch the battle from the mountaintop, and when the game's over, they give their critique, and they're they're going to critique the coach and say how they can do much, so much better than the coach. So that's sort of where that quote come from. I believe it is. It might have been Rick Riley's quote, but, um, yeah, I've made it my own. So what you're saying is if you're stealing from Mike Bianchi, you're stealing twice? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Although Mike Bianchi has been stolen from as well. So let's not forget that. AKA Steve Spurrier, fun and gun, free shoes you. Last question I'll ask. Is there anything on your bucket list? Is there anything that you want to do that you've not had the chance to do yet? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've covered just about every major sporting event, Masters, U.S. Opens, World Series, Super Bowls, college football, national championship games, Final Fours. One thing I've never covered, and I should have actually, because I, I probably could have finagled my way into getting one of my newspapers to send me. I've always wanted to cover a college football game at Notre Dame, at Notre Dame Stadium. I've never been to Notre Dame. I've never been to Notre Dame Stadium of course, college football is my favorite sport. Notre Dame is, you know, Notre Dame Stadium. That's the the holy grail of college football up there. So I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to see touchdown Jesus. I, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a spiritual guy. So I've always wanted to sort of, you know, tour Notre Dame's campus as well with all the beautiful architecture and all of that. So I would say that would be the one sporting thing that would be on my bucket list. In just a few seconds, we'll have some closing thoughts on this episode, so stay tuned. If you're enjoying it so far, please consider subscribing or sharing and leave a review. Let me know what you'd like to hear in the future on Media Credentials. Among the many reasons why I wanted Mike on the podcast was to give some props to the newspaper industry. When I'm home, I read the Orlando Sentinel cover to cover every day, a habit I picked up from my parents, who also still read the newspaper cover to cover every day. And when I travel, I always read the local newspaper. Media in general is in a rough spot right now. Mike mentioned how some newspapers are only printing a few days a week. Local radio stations are increasingly relying on automation to save money. National outlets like ESPN and The Athletic are cutting costs through layoffs. When content decisions are driven by money, real journalism suffers. Mike is an opinion guy, a columnist, and a sports radio talk show host. But I respect the fact that he understands that while you can have an opinion, you better have your facts straight. Now, go read the newspaper. <laughs>
Thanks again for listening to Media Credentials. For examples of my work, including video and audio clips, a blog, and my contact page, check out witwatson.com.